Welcome back. It's my pleasure now to introduce you to Dr. Kunli Odensi, who is here to tell us all about the latest advances in immunotherapy for cancers of the female reproductive system, including cervical, fallopian, ovarian, and uterine cancers. Dr. Odensi is the director of the UChicago Medicine Comprehensive Cancer Research Center, Dean for Oncology, and the AbbVie Foundation Distinguished Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Chicago. He's also an Associate Director of the Cancer Research Institute Scientific Advisory Council. You can leave your questions for Dr. Odensi in the Q&A box. Ryan Brewer from the Cancer Research Institute will share them with Dr. Odensi throughout this session. Dr. Odensi, Brian, let's get started. Thank you so much, Tamron and Brian, for inviting me to speak at this Immunotherapy Patient Summit. I also want to thank the CRI for organizing this uh, patient summit year after year. It's an incredible opportunity to, um, for us to learn and to really understand some of the latest developments um, in the field. So today I'm going to focus on immunotherapy for gynecologic cancers. So the first question is, what are gynecologic cancers? They are simply cancers of the female reproductive tract as shown on this slide, cancers can arise from the uterus, from the fallopian tubes, from the ovaries, from the cervix, from the vagina, and from the vulva. If you take all of these cancers together, there are more than 100,000 new patients that will be diagnosed each year in the United States, and about 33,000 women will die from gynecologic malignancies each year in the United States. Now, the question is, why is this? So of all of these cancers, ovarian cancer is actually um, one of the most lethal uh, malignancies. Ovarian cancers are much more lethal because number one, they are not detected early. Um, there are no early detection tests right now. As you know, you can have pap smear or HPV testing for cancer of the cervix. Uh, but for ovarian, we don't have any test. The other one that um, is a very close cousin of ovarian cancer are the fallopian tube cancers. And in fact, recent evidence suggests that some of the cancers that we call ovarian cancer actually have their origin from the fallopian tube. Uterine cancers are the most common, um, uh, but the, the main point about uterine cancers is that the majority occur um, at stage one, where they are potentially curable. Cervix, vaginal, and vulva cancers are thought to be HPV-related, the human papilloma virus. And now there are good screening tests for cancer of the cervix, um, the regular pap smears, as well as HPV testing, could detect pre-malignant disease long before it, become can it becomes cancer so that um, we can intervene. So this is the landscape of gynecologic cancers. And the question is, um, what, what, is the, what, what, what is new for gynecologic cancers? What are some of the um, current and next generation strategies of immunotherapy for gynecologic cancers? I'm going to speak um, about um, three cancers. When I, when I talk about cancer of the cervix, some of the information can be extrapolated to cancer of the vagina and vulva. Um, not all of it, but, but at least some of it. Um, um, and then cancer of the ovary. So let's start with um, the, one, the, the most widely practiced immunotherapy, which is the use of checkpoint blockade therapies. These are therapies, as you recall, where you block an immune checkpoint so that you can allow immune cells, especially T cells, to function better. Um, these T cells, when they are present in tumor, they are often exhausted. In other words, they are not able to perform their function. So the question is, how can you rescue these T cells? So checkpoint blockade immunotherapies um, have become very widely used in many cancer types. Um, so the question is, what is the, you know, what is the status of checkpoint blockade therapy in gynecologic malignancies? 
Um, let me start with ovarian. Ovarian cancers have generally not been as responsive as we would love for um, to immune checkpoint blockade. Many of the initial studies testing monotherapy, when you use a checkpoint blocker alone, um, response rates are on average of about 10, maybe 15%. And then the field moved on to begin to combine with other types of, of um, interventions, like phase three studies, looking at combination with chemotherapy, for example. And again, many of those results have been disappointing for at least for recurrent ovarian cancers. There are now some studies where um, combination is being tested in um, conjunction with other newer agents, such as bevacizumab, Evastin, and other types of, of therapies. So it's a very active field. However, uh, and I would address this towards the end, there is a subset of patients. There's a subset of patients that seem to respond. Who are these patients, and can we identify them um, um, and, and, you know, for, for this type of therapies? So checkpoint blockade therapy in ovarian cancers, um, all of the large studies have not been very um, promising as of now. It's an active field of investigation. I think we need to identify the right combinations as well as identify which patients are most likely to respond. Um, the um, but let me point out that checkpoint blockade therapy has been effective in endometrial cancers. So they are approved now for um, microsatellite unstable endometrial cancers. You, um, those, are the, the, those are situations where you can use immune checkpoint blockade, especially um, anti-PD-1, PDL one blockade therapies. And then for even microsatellite um, um, stable um, cancers where there's recurrence, it is possible to combine checkpoint blockade with some form of a class of drugs called tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Um, the specific one is lenvatinib. So it's very important to test whether a uterine cancer, endometrial cancer, has evidence of microsatellite instability when you have recurrence or, recurrent or advanced cancers. Um, the other indication for use of checkpoint blockade is when you have high tumor mutation burden. This is an, um, a kind of a blanket approval for any cancer type. Um, again, it's important to get molecular testing, understand whether there's high mutation burden, and even for ovarian cancers, many of those patients with high mutation burden potentially um, could respond. For cervical cancers, um, there are studies showing efficacy of immune checkpoint blockade. And this is an area, again, that we need to improve, but uh, initial studies indicate that there is clinical benefit. Let me quickly go through the other modalities. Um, the first one is adoptive T cell therapies. At the present time, there are no approved adoptive T cell therapies for ovarian cancers. Many of the studies are investigational, but there are promising results. There was a recent report from um, the European Society of Medical Oncology um, meeting um, in Europe um, that showed that some strategies where you can actually modify the, the T cell with what is called T cell receptor. So basically, um, the, the, this T cell receptor is what allows a T cell, an immune cell, to recognize and attack its target, which is the cancer cell. So by modifying against um, um, a T cell receptor specific for an antigen, it is possible to give large numbers of these cells and mediate tumor regression. So there are some initial promising results um, of this approach, um, but large numbers are going to be required um, before we can definitively say that these are, um, this, this has a place in ovarian cancer therapies. Um, but my suspicion is that, like all other things, cancer cells tend to fight back. When you give these T cells, cancer cells become resistant. So it's going to be important for us to identify combinations that can allow these T cells to function better. There are the third um, group are bispecific antibodies. This is an exploding field. And essentially, what these antibodies do is to have two antibodies 
Now, let me give you an example. Advastin or bevacizumab is an antibody. It's a single antibody. Can, you can imagine if you now put two antibodies together and you lick them together um, um, so that they can recognize different, different aspects within the tumor. So one approach is to make an, an antibody that can bind, that can bind to T cells and, and also target um, um, a molecule on the surface of the cancer cell. So think about it. When the antibody binds to the T cell, what it does is to bring the T cell into geographic proximity to the cancer cell and allows for recognition and tumor destruction. So there are many of them now in clinical trials. None have been approved yet, but these are very promising um, areas of, of, of studies for all of the gynecologic malignancies. Neoantigen vaccines. These are uh, um, um, vaccines that are made from, um, based on knowledge of mutations within the tumor. So you, you, again, you do molecular testing, you identify the mutations, and you design vaccines so that you, you instruct or train the T cells to recognize that these mutations are abnormal, just like a T cell will recognize a virus such as COVID or papilloma virus. The T cell now sees the mutated um, cancer cell and sees it at, as foreign and therefore goes on to, to, to destroy. A key area that we must, that I kind of have begun to talk about is identifying biomarkers. This is so critical uh, for this field, especially for ovarian, actually for all of the gyne gynecologic malignancies, understanding who is likely to respond and who is unlikely to respond so that the folks who are unlikely to respond, we spare them um, um, the to potential toxicity from a treatment that maybe may not work. So this is a very active area that we and others have incorporated a lot in our clinical trials, where we're taking biopsies, including liquid biopsies, in order to identify potential biomarkers of responsiveness. And so you can see that it's a very active, um, um, active field. Clinical trials are coming up um, all the time, and, um, and, and we're very excited with some of the, some of the recent um, um, developments. So um, how do we um, improve a patient immune response? How do we enhance immunotherapy? Again, um, I think I've talked a little bit about combination approaches. We need to understand what is going on within the tumor in order to select proper combinations. And part of that is a proper molecular analysis, so analysis of the tumor environment um, before selecting combinations. Many of these combinations are currently still in clinical trials, but I will encourage anyone listening to this who is thinking about clinical trials. Clinical trials, even at phase one level nowadays, can lead to chaos because these are very carefully thought approaches whereby um, combining, um, even when you put two drugs together nowadays, is based on the very best science. So I will encourage to um, to seek out clinical trials um, for personalized approaches, again, based on the molecular testing. And then, and then as a field, um, we continue to um, study um, um, biomarkers that could help us identify responders, potential responders versus potential non-responders. And with that, I would like to thank, um, again, thank CRI, um, thank um, Brian, thank Tamron, and I'll be happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Odunzi, for sharing that updated information about the latest breakthroughs in treating ovarian and other gynecologic cancers with immunotherapy. Um, a lot of interesting questions have come up from those who are watching uh, today, as well as people who have submitted questions during uh, the registration process. So I'd like to get to those right away. Uh, you mentioned uh, molecular testing several times as an important way for doctors to understand whether or not a patient perhaps is more or less likely to respond to immunotherapy. Can you tell us more about what those tests entail? Are they part of the regular checkup that a patient gets when, when they're diagnosed with one of these cancers? Or is this something that they have to ask for? 
I think, um, so that's a great question. Um, I think at the present time, the use of molecular testing is not uniform across the country. Um, there are institutions where if you go for your treatment, it's part of the standard, um, standard, standard care. Um, and there are institutions where it is not. So I will encourage patients to ask for this test because um, the test can identify patients who are likely to respond. I'll give you the example of the uterine cancer. Number one, if a patient has microsatellite unstable uterine cancer, microsatellite instability can be determined either by um, something called immunostochemistry, where you look under the microscope, or it can be determined by the molecular test, where you actually look for mutations in the genes um, that are responsible for this, for what is called microsatellite uh, stability. So that's one aspect. Then the second is that you can also look for the tumor mutation burden, whether this is ovarian or uterine or cervix, um, this is something that should be obtained, especially in the setting of recurrent disease, whereby you do the molecular testing so you understand whether um, the patient has a high tumor mutation burden and potentially will be responsive to immune checkpoint inhibitor. So those are two key tests. But when you do molecular testing panels, additional information come up where you can identify potential pathways that are disrupted in the cancer, and then you can appropriately triage the patient either to a, an appropriate standard of care or, um, or triage the patient to um, a clinical trial that, that focuses on, on, on the abnormal pathway. I'll give you an example. I had a patient who, who has ovarian tumor um, where normally in the old days, we don't test ovarian, we, we don't do molecular testing. At the time of molecular testing, we found that there's HER2 amplification. And guess what? HER2 amplification has been long recognized in breast cancer patients where there are established treatments for targeting the HER2 pathway. So we decided to treat this patient um, in that, in, you know, in um, targeting the HER2 pathway and the patient had a great response. So those are the usefulness of molecular testing. And um, I will encourage patients um, to, um, to at least ask their providers um, whether or not um, they can have the test. It almost sounds like uh, personalized medicine, which we, we touched on uh, initially. What does that mean uh, when a, a, a treatment plan is uh, designed custom for a patient based on these tests? So, in a sense, um, these are personalized approaches because you are actually selecting treatment based on the features of the cancer. So in days gone by, we, a patient has ovarian cancer, everybody gets platinum and taxol. Those are still important drugs, but we need to begin to think beyond those drugs and ask for each and every patient, what, what is the most appropriate therapy um, especially in the setting of recurrent disease. So um, you are absolutely right. This is personalized medicine. The, the other one that I did not talk about, um, which I'm, I'm sure most people in the audience will be familiar with, is the role of BRCA testing, BRCA testing. That also is very critical for identifying patients who are likely to respond to PAP inhibitors. PAP inhibitors, um, of course, are not immunotherapies, but there is a, there's an aspect of PAP inhibitors that may, um, in terms of how they work, that may um, potentiate immunotherapies. So there are ongoing studies looking at combination of PAP inhibitors, especially in BRCA mutation carriers or patients who have um, HRD, which is another feature that you can identify on molecular testing. Um, and those patients are likely to benefit from PAP inhibition and potentially um, with combination, you know, um, combination with immune checkpoint inhibitor, but those large studies, the results are still pending. 
So what I'm hearing is it's, it's important to have those tests done. There is uh, much to be gained uh, for the patient as well as the healthcare team in learning about potential positive um, indications of, of therapies that might work as well as therapies that won't work. So we're not wasting valuable time of the patient if we know that they're not going to respond to checkpoint blockade, for, uh, for example, because the, the way their test runs. So you mentioned mac microsatellite instability is MSI. That's one of the, the tests. Tumor mutational burden is another one of the, so how mutated is your tumor? How foreign does it look to the immune system? Uh, the more foreign it looks to the immune system, the more likely you might respond to immunotherapy, I think is the, is the going um, <clears throat> thought on that. And then you also talked about these other uh, genes involved, we know, for breast cancer. So obviously there seems to be some link between uh, breast cancer and ovarian cancer and the expression of these genes or mutations in these genes. So that's very interesting too. And then of course, coming back to combination approaches and uh, you know the idea that immunotherapy alone might not work, which you said uh, in your presentation. Sometimes the combination of immunotherapy with another treatment approach might be more effective in patients and that there are numerous ongoing trials. So that's really positive news. Um, if I'm a patient and I'm, I'm diagnosed with one of these cancers, obviously I, I wouldn't be diagnosed with gynecologic cancer, but still, it would it would it would it would reassure me i think to know that there are these other options so when a patient gets this news and let's say you mentioned ovarian cancer is particularly hard to to treat um, because it's often detected very late i want to talk about why is it harder to treat when it's detected late and then um, you mentioned there are no tests currently for early detection of ovarian cancer and I'd like to know if there's anything going on there, especially in the immunological arena. Yeah, so those are great questions, um, Brian. So first of all, ovarian cancer, the, the ovaries are very small organs that lie in the pelvis, in the female pelvis. And you can imagine before you can get symptoms, they need to grow to very large size. So, um, so it's been a difficult challenge to diagnose ovarian cancer at, at an early stage. So about 80, 85% of ovarian cancers will present as stages three or four, whereas a small fraction will be stage one. So you can imagine if we, if we can find a test to shift the curve so that we see more stage one rather than stage three, we will help many more, more women. So those tests, um, Lots of research over the years, um, looking at CA125, ultrasound, um, there are ongoing studies looking at metabolites, um, looking at antibodies made by ovarian tumors, um, liquid biopsy analysis, circulating free DNA. A lot of effort is going into this. Um, I suspect, again, this is the, uh, the this is speculation. Um, that, that I think we're going to crack this in the next few years because technologies have become um, so sophisticated that potentially um, you can find circulating tumor DNA um, in asymptomatic patients. So those studies are ongoing and um, hopefully we'll be able to show that um, we can detect ovarian cancer at a very early stage where it's potentially curable. The cure rate for stage one is close, is 90 to 95%, complete cure. So, um, so, so that's where we want to be. We don't want to be at stage three or stage four. So you're talking about when you say liquid biopsies, it's a blood draw. And we look for the presence of this cancer DNA in a patient's blood as an early warning signal. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. But you can imagine the so if if I if I take any any anyone's blood, there's a lot of DNA, right? There is, you know, there are white cells. So it's like searching for a needle in a in a haystack. So how do you find these minute quantities of DNA circulating tumor DNA among a massive background of potential noise? Um, but that problem. Um, has been resolved to a very large extent and the technologies 
continue to develop. So again, I, I suspect that it's only a matter of time before we were able to find an early detection test for variant cancer. Right now, there is none. Consequently, most patients still come in at stage three and stage four. That, that's that, and that's where it really matters um, to, to find new therapies uh, for cancer, especially for these gynecologic cancers and, and notably ovarian cancer. So um, why, though, is ovarian cancer particularly tough to treat with the immune system, unlike other types of cancer that seem to respond more readily? That is um, actually um, a, a great question. Um, and we think there are several potential reasons. Number one, ovarian cancers tend not to have high mutation burden, unlike lung cancer or melanomas where the mutation is very high. Therefore, um, the immune system has no trouble looking at melanoma or lung cancer and saying, this is foreign. This doesn't belong here. This is like a virus infection. Whereas in ovarian cancers, mutations are less frequent. So that's number one. Number two, ovarian cancers tend to have um, a lot of factors that suppress the immune system. Within the ovarian um, microenvironment, you can have as many T cells or immune cells as possible, and yet they are suppressed via multiple, multiple mechanisms. So what we think the future holds is to devise a strategy to reprogram that environment and turn it from a suppressive to a more active environment where the immune cells, the T cells, can survive, can function, and can you know, do their job without being affected by, by this immune suppressive network. Those immune suppressive network um, consist of you know, some of the cancer cells themselves. They are throwing out stuff, chemicals, and, and a lot of things to combat the immune system you know, that, so that they can survive, they can escape from immune attack. So, um, so we need to, um, to really um, tackle that issue, that challenge. And one of the ways that we are using at the University of Chicago um, is to generate um, viruses. These are called oncolytic viruses um, that, we inject, that we inject directly into the tumor in order to create a state where the immune system thinks you know, there's danger, there, there's virus, and therefore it's going after it in the process, it goes after, after the, the tumor cells as well. Um, but in addition to just putting in viruses, you can actually design the virus to deliver a payload. And that's something that we have done so that the virus goes in, um, it's destroying the cancer cells, it's um, um, providing this environment where immune system is revved up, and then it's also producing a substance that will block many of those things um, that we called immune suppression. So, um, so this is a strategy that we are exploring. And um, um, again, we, you know, we, we're going to be starting a phase one trial to explore this, um, and hopefully this will mature into phase two and phase three. That's, that's super fascinating. Uh, you spoke earlier about how technology has advanced and it allows uh, individuals like you and, and the broader cancer research community to accelerate kind of the rate of discovery and try more things faster uh, and get down to the individual patients. So this is really, really good news. Uh, I know um, as someone who lost his grandmother to ovarian cancer, this is, uh, this is a horrible disease. Um, <clears throat> So you also talked about, uh, I want to get to recurrence and, and how immunotherapy might be helpful in preventing recurrence. But first, let's go away from ovarian cancer and talk about some of the HPV-related cancers you discussed, so the vulvar, vaginal, and cervic, cervical cancer, for which there are pap, pap smears and tests to see if there's a risk of potentially developing one of those cancers in the future. Why are those uh, cancers more receptive to treatment with immunotherapy? Um, the short answer is because they are due to viral infection. So human papilloma virus is foreign. The immune system has no trouble in recognizing that, you know, the virus, which is in 99% of 
cervical cancer is present in the cancer. So you can imagine you can reprogram immune cells specific for human papilloma virus that will at the same time destroy the tumor. And that has been very successful, both in terms of immune checkpoint inhibitors, as well as in terms of um, um, adoptive cell therapies. Um, so there are some initial reports where if you take human papilloma virus specific immune cells and you grow them up into large numbers and you infuse them back into cervical cancer patients, you see tremendous regression um, of, of those tumors. So, um, so cervical cancers, vaginal cancers, I mean, there are not a lot of studies in vaginal and, and vulva. Those are relatively rare cancers. Uh, but you can imagine that if they are also due to human papilloma virus, some of those same principles will apply um, to both vaginal and vulvar cancers. As well as other HPV-associated cancers, I assume, uh, like head and neck and tongue and that sort of uh, type of cancer. And of course, now we have uh, vaccines to prevent against infection with the types of HPV virus that can lead to these cancers. And so I imagine we'll be seeing, a, we'll continue to see a decline um, in the rates of those cancers over time as vaccine adoption uh, picks up steam, we hope. <laughs> That's the plan. Um, so talk, speaking of vaccines again, um, uh, recurrence, uh, certainly for certain types of cancer, uh, there's a very high risk of cancer coming back after a patient has responded to you know, types of therapy, whether it be chemo, radiation, even, even uh, immunotherapy. But how is immunotherapy? It, it, if someone has uh, had a complete response to treatment, let's say they're stage four ovarian cancer, they've had a complete response to, to standard treatment. Um, microscopically, they have no evidence of disease, but we know historically that their risk of recurrence is fairly high. How is immunotherapy able to help in that instance? Um, so that's a good question. Um, we, in terms of immune checkpoint inhibitors, they have not been tested in that setting, trying to minimize the risk of relapse. What we and others have tested is the potential for vaccination to minimize the risk of relapse, or at least at a minimum, prolong the remission, the time in remission. Um, so we actually tested for many years a vaccine that is targeting um, a molecule that is expressed in about 35% of ovarian cancer patients, a um, molecule called NYESO1, whereby patients get their initial treatment, they're in remission, no evidence of disease, and then we start to vaccinate. We reviewed our results a few years ago and looked at patients who received vaccination versus patients who did not. It was a retrospective study. It wasn't a randomized trial. Retrospective analysis of patients who got vaccine versus patients who did not. The overall survivor difference was staggering, was remarkable. Um, so we think there's a role for vaccines. Um, now either vaccines such as the ones against um, a, a molecule like NYESO1, or even these new antigen vaccines, whereby the goal is not for therapy, the goal is secondary prevention. You are trying to prevent relapse, generate immune, the immune system, immune reaction, um, so that as the cancer begins to come back, the immune cells are ready, primed, ready to go and destroy those cancers as they want to try and re-emerge. So, um, so I think vaccines, we need to test it a little bit more, um, especially in the setting of rem patients in remission. That's, that's excellent news. And unfortunately, we don't have time to get to all the questions that uh, attendees have submitted. Uh, so we'll just wrap up with a question uh, for you, Dr. Odunzi. Uh, how has the advent of immunotherapy changed the outlook for women with gynecologic cancers? Um, I, I think immunotherapies have changed the outlook remarkably, um, especially for uterine cancers as well as cervical cancers. For ovarian, it's only a matter of time. We now have a deep understanding, deep understanding of the ovarian 
um, of ovarian tumors, including their microenvironment, what makes the cancer tick? What, you know, how, how are they affecting the immune system? We now have a, a, a better understanding um, such that now we can develop strategies to overcome many of those immune suppression that I talked about earlier, because that is the major Achilles heel um, that, that we need to deal with in, um, in order to improve immunotherapy for ovarian cancer. So I think the outlook um, is great. Um, the fact that it's, it's worked very well in uterine and cervical cancers, very encouraging. Um, and it's only a matter of time before we crack um, the ovarian cancer um, 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 challenge. That's wonderful to hear. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us and all of our viewers today. Uh, we know that uh, cancer affects everyone and knowing what's happening specifically in cancers that affect women is extremely important and all the great immunotherapy advances happening there. Dr. Kunli Odunzi, thank you again for joining us and uh, we all wish you well at, at University of Chicago uh, to advance these treatments so that more lives can be saved. Thank you, Brian. My pleasure.